Hello, everybody. Welcome to In the Code Garden, the last episode for the year. I'm Renee Noble, the Regional Cloud Advocate for Microsoft Reactor in Australia and New Zealand. And yeah, we're here to do some fun Christmas themed coding today. We're joined by special guest host, Jack Reichelt. He's the CTO of Connected Code. He is also a professional dungeon master and the founder of his own business called Adventure Events. And he is a diehard uh, advent of code doer. His favorite month of the year is December because he just loves it so much. So obviously we have to have him here for this advent of code garden series and the third episode of the series. Welcome back, That's Jack. True. I love it. Yeah, I'm happy to be back for the last one. Excellent. Yeah, as we've said before, Jack has actually finished Advent of Code before. I've never actually made it through to the end. I just don't have the time and the commitment to put, push through 25 days of increasingly difficult problems. They do seem very interesting towards the end, and I do, I do have loved algorithms in the past, but Jack has the commitment to the Advent of Code world uh, that I, yeah, you know, I, I you know, strive towards, but also strive towards doing 8,000 other things. So uh, we, we need Jack here for the final episode. He's going to give <laughs> us some tips for the final chunk of the uh, of the thing as well at the end for the episodes we're not going to do. Uh, but yeah, let's talk about what we're, going to, what we're going to do today before we get to the tips for the rest of Advent of Code. So we're, at, we're going to go through, we've got five problems since, that have come out since the last episode we put on. Uh, so we're going to tell you our top tips. These are quite big problems. Uh, so we're not going to walk through doing the whole of each of those problems. We'll say what the key was that we used for solving that problem. Um, and yeah, top tips of things to think about when you approach the problem. And then after that, we'll have tips for the rest of the advent of code problems that haven't come out yet, uh, but things to watch out for. Um, and yeah, hopefully you have an awesome rest of the comp competition. Sorry. Uh, yeah. So let us get started with the first problem, uh, which is problem number nine. Yeah. Okay. Over so this one over to you, Jack. Yeah. So for this problem, um, what we have is uh, you're walking along a creaky rope bridge and it snaps. Um, but luckily, you know how to uh, calculate where the rope is going to be so it doesn't whip you on the way down. Um, with this one, you've there's a, there's a series of rules for how a rope behaves, where a rope has a tail and a head that is for a, a specific length of the rope, and the tail moves, the, the head follows a set of steps that are given as the input of your problem, and the tail moves in relation to the head. So we can see here in these examples, like when the head moves too far to the right, then the tail moves right to catch up. When the head moves too far down, then the tail moves down to catch up. And then there are some rules for how it handles diagonal cases and what what it's allowed to do and what its behavior should be like. Yeah, it always so, moves towards the head and yeah, it's, it, to get as close as possible really. Um, and it can move diagonally. So that's the top one to watch out for. And how to calculate that will be, what am I, that's gonna be my tip for this one. Uh, yeah, so continue on Jack. <laughs> Yeah, um, and so if we then we scroll down a little bit further, we can see the set of instructions. So here the head moves right four steps, um, and then up four steps, and then left three steps, and so on and so forth. Um, so one, I guess, I guess let's start off with a couple of things to think about for this problem. The kind of thing that I thought about before I started implementing it was we need to keep track of positions but we don't so much care about like where in the whole space it is. So much like um, we discussed before, here is a perfect opportunity to use an infinite grid. Um, you can say that wherever the head and then all the other parts and, and then the tail starts is uh, position zero, zero. And so uh, moving to the right moves it to one, zero. Um, you don't have to have a fixed grid size for this. So I think that's that's a nice easy thing um, that will make it easier rather than defining yourself a whole grid. Um, that's a good thing at the start. Absolutely, but, something yeah, to watch out for that one. Cause I was like, oh yeah, it's just this big and you'll get your problem, uh, your problem data, which I'll open up 
Yeah, I'm not logged into this one apparently. One second. Um, I'll just bring up another one on my other screen that has the data, but I didn't kind of realize at first that it is not going to uh, matter uh, that it the, the, the grid grows, which I think, because uh, this is a later on example, and they just keep getting bigger. So check out that problem um, input and you'll see it's very big and the example shows you the problem, you know, once we get to later on, you'll see that it gets you know, bigger and curlier. So yeah, continue on, Jack. Yeah, so definitely that's one thing to think about. The other thing to think about is, and and you might have seen it as Renee was showing part two there, yeah. but think about how, <clears throat> pardon me, with this problem, it really pays to think about how you are going to represent your row. So initially, or how I solved part one was I just kept track of two positions. Um, I kept track of the head position and I kept track of the tail position. Um, this, this ended up being a mistake. So um, a lot of the time in problems in advent of code, um, part one will be do a problem and then part two will be do it more complicated. Like, well, no, that's, that's pretty much always the case. But in this case, it now said, rather than just having a rope with a head and a tail, you've actually got all sorts of segments. So you have one chunk at the start with a head and a tail. And then there's another chunk where that tail is the head. And then there's a second chunk and so on. And you actually had 10 of these chunks in total. Um, and so my initial solution where I just had the head position as a global variable and the tail position as a global variable didn't work. And I basically needed to refactor into using a class. There are ways to do it without having it be a class, absolutely. But I find that a class helps me keep track much more easily of a set of related pieces of data. Um, and it let me keep track of everything that I needed to and just focus on smaller chunks of the problem rather than the whole problem for the whole rope all at once. Interesting. Yeah, so when I got to part two, I didn't go the class route. And I'm looking at my solution over here. Come onto this screen. Solution. Come on to, okay, here we go. Come on. All my sheet keyboard shortcuts have stopped apparently. Um, okay. I want to make but, the font a bit bigger. Oh, yes. Good idea. Uh, yeah. But I've gone and I've just made a list of uh, what have I called them? Somewhere in here is called Taylors or something. Oh, it's because it's in part two. I've made a separate file for mine. <laughs> And I've just got a list of all of my different pieces, which I've essentially treated the same as part one, but you know, treating one as a head and one as a tail, and the next one as a head and the next one as a tail, because it follows the same rules that the original head and tail follow. But you could go either the class route and apply it to each of those pieces, or you could treat it as a list as a possible other option. So you've got yeah. some options on how you approach that one when you get to part two. But should we talk about? Um, how we worked out if things were adjacent or if they needed to catch up. Because if the head gets more than one space away in terms of the diagonal yeah. as well, we need to make sure we're going to catch up with the tail um, up to the head. So I'm going to bring on the, the um, examples again. Yep. Here we have the head and tail moving across, that's fine. They're still next to each other. Um, this is still next to each other on the diagonal, but at some point uh, they get too far away. So let's get back to the rules. Yeah, that one's oh, showing the, the movements yeah, having happened. That's the movements. But yes, this is too far away. So the tail needs to catch up on that step. Um, and things like this one here also is too far away. So if it was on the diagonal, it'd be fine. But once it gets, you know, what, there's this row in between, so we do need the tail to catch up. And it's going to catch up not just by going up one, but it's going to get as close as it can by going into this spot here. So up one diagonally. Yeah. So if you go back to the code, I'll show you kind of my neat trick for this because I thought it was 
uh, pretty clever. Um, I'll find the code. One second. Here we go. It's behind here. Um, I've got two global variables that I used to use that I don't need to. Um, <laughs> so um, here we have this uh, RLM, which is calculated by rope length. If we have a look at that function here, um, this is some fairly basic trigonometry. This is Pythagoras theorem, uh, if you remember back to high school. Um, and the reason that I've done this is because it gives us a really neat little property, which is when, when the rope is adjacent uh, in any of the cardinal directions, uh, the Pythagoras uh, theorem will give us a distance of one. When it's adjacent in an ordinal direction, that is the diagonals, that gives us a distance of the square root of two. So 1.4 something, something. I think it's 1.414. Um, anyway, then, then uh, we, we have a special case where if it's just two steps up or two steps right or two steps in any cardinal direction, but not diagonal at all, the length will be two, exactly. Otherwise, it's going to be greater than two to some degree. When it's two steps up and one to the right, it is greater than two. Um, and that means that we can have this one function give us the data we need for our three special, for our three distinct cases, where either the length is less than two, so it's close enough and we just don't have to do anything or the length is exactly two, so we're either going to move one step horizontally or one step vertically, but not both. And then if it's diagonally away, we move one step horizontally um, and one step vertically. And I've selected the wrong ones there, but essentially we do, we do one step of each. And that ensures that we're always catching up. Mm -hmm. So we so we've got this rope length um, function on here. So that's using here, um, and yeah, you're using actual Pythagoras there uh, to get that done. I had a slightly different approach, but still the same outcome. I will pop mine just on the screen, just below yours. Uh, yours looks a lot cleaner than mine now that I look at it. Um, no, that's because I put them all together. Uh, but because we know. Um, basically that we're never going to be more than two away. I've just done it like this using absolute values because that way I don't actually care what direction things are. Mine, mine is slightly differently constructed than yours. So I've got my part in here. I'm just going to comment this out so it actually lights up. Um, but yes, we've got my things so with the head and the tail. Um, this is from part two. I could have used my other part one. Let's say let's get this one. Um, but if you hate Pythagoras for some reason, this could this could be for you. Um, and I can get two coordinates and just take the uh, distance for each of them add them together. And then once again, do that same thing, saying if it's greater than two. Um, so you don't have to use Pythagoras because we know that even in a Manhattan distance, uh, which is we know the term for going up and one across, it's still going to be greater than two don't necessarily have to calculate the diagonal length. But yeah, that's another take on this part of the problem. Yeah. Um, and part of the reason why I did Pythagoras is uh, that calculation I held over from part one. And I just thought we might need to know more detail in part two. Like maybe the rope is less springy and it can actually get, you know, three spaces away or something. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, that gave me a nice bit of flexibility for later on. Mm -hmm. um, and then the catching up, once, once you know what direction it, or rather how far away it is and what type of movement, whether it's you're just moving on the X by one or Y by one or both by one, um, then it's just a matter of working out which direction, which is what these ifs and elses are doing. They're checking like if, the tail's y coordinate is less than the head's y coordinate, then you need to move, then you need to add one to the tail's y coordinate. Um, and that's all that it's really doing here. Um, and so we, it, it's, it's a problem that requires a little bit of thinking to work out what the rules are and how they work. 
but the code itself is fairly uh, basic coordinate addition. Um, oh, the other thing I've done here is you might see that I have this like plus u uh, element zero and plus u element one. If we scroll up, I just define some constants uh, at the top and these are up, down, left, and right. And they're essentially when, when a piece moves up, down, left, or right, that is the difference it takes. So when you move up, we add one to the second element of its coordinate. Uh, and that's, that's just a handy way so that I could keep track of what each line and what each addition was doing uh, rather than having to think like, oh, well, you know, this one I need to add, this one I need to subtract. And oh, did I do moving right or did I do moving left? And it just gave me a little letter that I could see. And so when I scroll down and look at the um, all those ifs and elses with the moves, we can see on any of them, like, you know, uh, yeah, that one's moving to the right. Otherwise, it moves to the left. Uh, and for the other if, it moves up. Otherwise, it moves down. Mm, that's all interesting. Stuff. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yes, yeah, because it does get confusing. Uh, I tackled oh, yeah. this slightly different, like, because you've got one for how to move to the left and one how to move to the right, for instance. I went and, like, you know what? I'm on my absolute value uh, angle. So I went and did that. And I did this instead, which um, which was looking at one part and then the other part, so the X and Y coordinates. And then I was like, I'm just going to get the absolute value of how far this is away. And I don't care which di direction it is at first. I just want to know the length. And then I'm going to actually divide by the absolute value of that distance so I can get just how many units it needs to go in, in what direction it needs to go. This one would give me the distance, which might be minus two. And then I don't, then I want to get, okay, well, I only need to go minus one in that direction. So I'm going to take the absolute value to get this in terms of um, just into minus one or positive one for X or Y. I've gone on a different angle with mine. Um, Look, Jack looks a lot sim simpler with his nice little dictionary things, but I did get to use absolute value a lot, which I did enjoy. So if you want to do that, it's possible, and you can do it in a one line to not have to have four lines. But maybe four lines is the smart thing to do. Who knows? <laughs> Who can say? Um, so I think that's our big tips for day nine. Um, yeah. I don't think I have anything else that's, that's clever that I want to add. Um, Feel yeah, free to chime in in the chat if you have any questions about that. But I think, yeah. yeah, let's move on to day 10. Fabulous. Excellent. On to day 10. Let's go have a look at what it is about. Day 10 is my favorite one so far. Oh, it's going to be the assembly one, isn't it? Yeah. So <laughs> while Renee pulls it up, I'll, I'll give a brief overview of this. So in Advent of Code, all, every year, I don't know of any year that hasn't had it, there's always at least one problem where you have to essentially program your own computer. And what this means is we define a bunch of uh, operations it can do, and you have to say, well, OK, it has these memory slots that each store a number, and they all start at 0, for example. And then when I run through the list of instructions that is my input, this instruction adds two to a given thing, or this one will add x to a given thing where x is the next part. These, these are some of my favorite problems in Advent of Code. Partially, because I'm a freak and I love assembly. <laughs> um, but partially, and partially because I'm a freak and I love state machines. Um, but my but this does mean that I have a whole bunch of advice for these ones because I've thought a lot about how to do them and make them work nicely and be clean and easy to read and efficient to write. Um, so uh, shall we flick over the code and I'll start Let's do it. Yeah. talking through some of the things that I did. Yeah. Well, yours is a lot longer than mine, I just realized. Interesting. Okay, tell us ah. what you did. So the reason mine is longer is I write these problems quite verbosely. Uh, and there's two reasons for that. One is this this one in, in the scale of Advent of Code's assembly language problems is fairly simple. But um, 
when something goes wrong in the assembly language problems, it can be very tricky to debug. And so having lots of nice functions that do very small chunks all on their own is a huge help in my experience. And so this makes your code quite verbose, but quite easy to debug and quite easy to read. The second thing is expansibility. I expect we will come back to this CPU that we have defined. Um, a lot of the time, the assembly language problems are built up over you know, three or four or one year. It was like eight different problems across the 25 days. And it, was, it kept saying, like, you know, go back to your answer for day whatever. Uh, now we need to add these functions and you're trying to get this output. So you need to add you know, this kind of stuff. And we have expanded our assembly language. So now it takes these inputs as well. And it just kept getting more and more complicated. So I wanted a class structure that I could keep track of nice and simple um, functions that only did one very small thing so that it was easy to debug and have it in a way that is nice and easy to expand. So um, for day 10's actual problem, what you have to do is uh, well, at the start, you have to go through a whole bunch of instructions. And there's only two types of instructions. There's add x, which adds the number given into a variable x that your CPU that you're doing has, and noop, which does nothing but does take a clock cycle. Uh, and that's really important. Um, interestingly, that's actually really important in real assembly language programming as well. If you're doing hardware systems, you might need things to take certain amounts of time and you might need certain operations to occur in the same length of time to other operations so that things sync up correctly. And so noop or nop, depending on whether your language uses three letter codes or four letter codes, uh, just stands for no op. And it all it does is it makes the computer wait for a clock cycle. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really useful. And that is, in fact, exactly what it is doing here. Uh, and we're using it to synchronize between things. So with this, with this problem, we've got to change the value of x as we go through our operations. And we have to print it out at the 20th, 60th, 100th, 140th, and so on um, clock cycles and then add them all together. Now, the interesting thing about this is that we, is that the add X operation actually takes two clock cycles. And so you need to have some way of keeping track of clock cycles that aren't just, oh, well, how many instructions have I got? And essentially in the middle of a instruction, spitting out your result. So. If we go over to uh, the code, um, let's, let's scroll down to my noop function, which mm. is on line 34. And we'll see that it actually just calls this function called self.step. Now, ignore this self.set pixel for now, because that's part of part two. But we add one to the clock cycle, and then we do self.log. And self.log checks the clock cycle and sees if it is um, this, this little formula here, uh, we won't necessarily, we won't go into right now, but checks to see if it's that one of those ones that it wanted logged. So 20, 60, 100, 140, so on. Um, and if it is one that we want to log, I print the clock cycle, I print self.x, uh, and self dot signal strength, which is um, the clock cycle times the x, which is the value that we actually want at each of those time steps. And then I add the signal strength to an array called signal beats. Um, signal beats is what we want to sum at the end in order to get our final answer. 
So. Mm, yeah, that was the trick for me is like you do need to get the beat before before it adu- adu- adjusts itself at the end of each step. So that's, yeah, watching out where which part of the cycles that you want to capture for that is important. Yeah, so the key thing there is line 31 and 32, making sure that you log after you increment the clock. Um, mm. But then if we skip down to the addX function on line 37, we want to be calling step twice because it takes two clock cycles to do. But we want to call step twice and then increment X because that way we ensure that we get the log happening at the correct time. And in the, in the description of the functions, it says, um, yeah, critically here, here it says, add X V takes two cycles to complete. After the two cycles, the X register is increased by the value V, which can be negative. And so uh, that's, that's the key spot where you need to make sure that you've got your order of operations correct, essentially. Um, but we can see here now that because I've defined this step function that does, that increments the clock cycle and logs if needed, all I have to do is just call add X it's just called step twice and then increment the x value. Um, and so our add x function is nice and small and easy to debug. If we've tested step, then we basically know it works because I trust that Python can add two numbers together. <laughs> um, and so that's that's basically our whole program there. Like there's there's a little bit that happens down below, but that's the main deal of we have those two operations, we have our step, we're logging the signal strength. Mm. Um, awesome. And so then I just create an instance of the CPU and I loop through all the instructions. Um, I have this signal sum that doesn't do anything and I should delete. Um, and uh, if it's noop, I tell the CPU to noop. Otherwise I get the value and I tell it to add X for the value. And then I can sum up the signal beats. Let's have a look at Renee's code before we move on to part two, though. Yeah, so mine is much shorter than Jack's. So you can see Jack's is our 58 lines of code. Mine, part one, is just, uh, where do we get up to? Uh, 23 lines of code. So two different, very different approaches because I'm like, I normally you know, quit uh, advent of code earlier than Jack, so I don't get to the craziest of the uh, advent of code problems. So I've gone in for a much simpler so- solution uh, and I'm just popping each cycle's um, results in here for X. And then I just, at the end, I just loop through those and I just start with, you know, the 20th, you know, cycle. And I just go every 40 cycles and I print it out. So, yeah, you can go for a simpler approach if you don't know, if you want to commit to the the full advent of code life just yet. I'm sure you'll get there. Uh, but there is a different way if you do want to approach it with a simple solution for this part, at least, yeah. Yeah. We talked so, about part two. Yeah, so part two, it reveals that uh, this code here is actually driving a CRT display. Um, and the X value shows the position of a sprite uh, in, in that the CRT has to draw. Now, there's a couple of nuances here that we'll get to in a second, but the, the broad overview is at each clock cycle, you're going to be drawing one pixel of a larger display. You're on day nine, not day I 10. I am. I've just realized that. I'm like, this doesn't look like a display or anything. <laughs> yep. And then way down the bottom and we get a picture example. Um, oh, actually. Uh, let's let's if we go to the start of part two, it's got a handy little pointer things on it. Um, yeah, yeah. There we go. So we can see that that the display has six rows, and on each cycle you draw one pixel from the whole thing. So the first forty cycles you're drawing the first row, then the next forty you're drawing the second row, and you're just drawing it every single step of the way. And what you do is when you're drawing a particular pixel, you check if it is within one distance of X. Now, it's got quite complicated wording here um, in this puzzle. 
And I don't disagree with the wording. The wording is describing how a real CRT actually works. Um, but it can lead to a lot of confusion because the way a real CRT actually works is confusing. Um, but if you, if you forget about the terminology and forget about it being a CRT, every clock cycle, you just check if the clock cycle's number, so starting at one, is within one in either direction of X's value. If it is, you draw a hash, otherwise you draw a dot. And that's it. Uh, that's, that's the whole rule. So if we swap back over to the code um, and look at line 30, in the step function, I have this set pixel. Um, and I set this before I increment the clock value because my clock is zero indexed. And so, and I've got a display array that is also zero indexed and it just helps to keep everything at zero. This would absolutely work if you, no, it wouldn't absolutely work if you increase it by one, if, if you swap those two lines, because that would change the clock value relative to X's position. So I call this set pixel function. Um, and then I say, uh, if, yeah, if the absolute value of the clock's position minus X is less than or equal to one, I append a hash, otherwise I append a dot. Now, the reason why I've got this mod 40 here is that we did breeze past a part of the problem, which is we're not actually checking, is that X's value is capped from zero to 40, basically. Um, we care about the clock cycle in relation to that. So once we've drawn the first row, and we're starting on row two with clock cycle 41, we want to turn on that pixel, not if X is close to 41, but if X is close to one. And that's all that modulo 40 does, is it essentially it wraps it at 40 and keeps that going there. So we just set this pixel. And then I have a draw display function that for every single, um, well, I've kept track of how many clock cycles we are rather than how many displays things there are. You could have, this could absolutely be uh, the length of the self dot display, but I knew the clock was also equivalent to that. Um, I print what I've stored in the display for that variable, uh, for that clock cycle. Uh, but I give it no end. And that just means rather than printing a new line after every print, we're just going to print nothing after. So if I said print the letter A with the end of nothing and then print the letter B with the end of nothing, we're not going to get A on a line, B on a line. We're just going to get A, B. Um, and then if the index modulo 40 is zero, then I print. And this is just giving us the new line between each line of the display. So then after I've processed all the instructions down the bottom, I just have to call cpu.drawdisplay and that all happens for me. Um, this, this meant that doing part two in this way didn't actually add much code. I literally just had to add that set pixel and that draw display function. Cool, that looks really awesome. And yeah, nice and clean. It just fits it right in with everybody else that's already there, all the code that's right there. Uh, coming in with the quick hack once again, it's my yeah. it's my way to do Advent apparently. I've gone mm -hmm. and it did take me a little while to figure out firstly this uh, whole CRT thing. That's not my area of expertise. Luckily, Jack would explain it to me because I had the three the wrong way around. I was looking for three, I was trying to draw a three pixel sprite essentially rather than looking for if this spot is adjacent to like part of a three pixel sprite essentially but that took me a little while to get under control uh but yeah just coming in i already have all those cycles stored um they're just there just like i'd gone through them before with my quick hack to get all the bits and pieces rather than doing it you know at time of processing and then i just went through and i took all those modulars to see if it was in the spot or adjacent to the spot of uh of x and then i just printed those out so that's how i got um that one done um, 
much much more similar to Jack's than the last one where Jack has the full setup and I've just got a four loop yes. basically. So yeah, but that's yeah, two different interesting approaches there. And they kind of both come together, can you know, converge to the same answer there at the end. And yes, as Sarah said uh, a little while ago, she had a lot of off by one errors in this. And I think I think we can all say we probably had a lot of off by one errors at some point during this. <laughs> Yeah, this is the kind of problem that definitely causes those. It, it's just you're dealing with too many index, indexes all at once and you've got your clock cycle indexes. You've got, well, does X start at one or does X start at zero? And you've got your like, well, which way do you order the things? Do you increment the clock cycle and then do X? Do you? And so on and so forth. So there's, there's lots of opportunities for off by one errors in this problem. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that was a really interesting problem. I don't think I've tackled many of the assembly problems in the past, but this was a nice one to get started with, I would say, if you haven't done them before. And yeah, definitely take this one on. Yeah. Cool. So shall we move to day 11? Yeah, I'll bring that up. And while, while we do that, I'll just throw back to Sarah, who's also said that she used our um, technique for infinite grids uh, for problem nine uh, with the from collections import default dict. And I that's my favorite thing to do, import a default dict, a default dictionary, uh, so you can go back and have a little glance at, uh, was it episode two that we talked about default dict? Maybe it was the end of yeah. episode one. Oh, I don't remember. Watch them both. Watch, watch them both. That sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was the end of episode one with a little little story too. This is probably going to come up, and it sure did. Um, the very next uh, bunch of questions, and this one too. Mm. So the next up, we've got monkey in the middle. This is mm -hmm. a fun little problem I found. Um, is it because the... you like monkeys, Jack? Is it because you love them? I, I do like monkeys. Monkeys are really <laughs> good. But um, no, I just felt that it was, it had a fun bit of parsing in it. Um, but if you don't want to do the parsing, it's a small enough amount of input that you can absolutely do it manually. Um, no, that's what I did. <laughs> which I may have regretted partway through, but, you know, I definitely figured out what I was doing by doing it manually. Yeah. And then part two is an interesting maths problem, which is quite mm. tricky, but then was fun to work out as well. So let's, let's have a look at this monkey zero here. Um, the, the short story is monkeys have stolen a bunch of your items from your backpack and now they're throwing them to each other and then fiddling with them and then passing them along and this is stressing you out. Um, so for each monkey in the input, we have a bunch of starting items and these numbers here are how worried you are about each item. Then they have an operation, which is what happens to your worry levels when the monkey fiddles with that item. Um, so if you, I can't do 79 times 19, but suppose that this monkey had a, an item with a value of 10 when it then fiddled with the item, your worry value would go up to 190 for that item. Um, there's another nuance, th there's another part to the problem, which we'll get to later, but let's just focus on the input now. Then we check if that item's worry value is divisible by 23, um, which is another way of saying if the mod 23 equals zero. Where mod is short for modulo. Yes. Um, and then if that statement is true, you give the item to monkey two, otherwise you give it to monkey three. And so this is all a fun bit of parsing. There's a few bits that are useful in there, but there's a whole bunch that actually isn't. Like those two lines of if true, throw to monkey two, and if false, throw to monkey three. For every monkey, those two lines are identical except the number at the very end. And also, the number at the very end is always a single digit because there's only eight monkeys even in the full sleep, even in the full input. And so you you actually only care about one character from that whole line. But it's 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 a lot of flavor and makes for interesting parsing. Yeah, once so, again with these lines as well, they're all going to say something like it is something divisible by 13. So yeah, when I was going through this problem, I was like, oh boy, there's a lot of text here. There's going to be so many different kinds of rules. How am I going to parse them all? And I have to write so much code to pass all the things that are going to be different. But even looking in the um, the actual my actual data for the problem, it's like no, they all say divisible, and they all say 
new equals old sum operation. So it's actually a lot of this text is just mm. the same in every single monkey case. Absolutely. And, and that operation is always either plus or multiply, mm -hmm. and then yeah. either a number or old again itself. Yeah. So, um, and then what you have to do is you have to uh, do 20 rounds of the monkeys playing with your stuff. So you do monkey zero, and for all of its items, you do the operation, you do the test, you throw the item to the next monkey. You do 20 rounds of this, and then you look at the monkeys that have um, performed the, the most, most operations. Mm. Yeah. And you multiply together, I think it was, the two... The two um, most active monkeys, yeah. Yeah, the two most active monkeys. Yes. So um, there's one other uh, facet to this problem, which is in part one. After you, after the monkeys have fiddled with your your item, after they've done their operation, you have to divide your worry by three because you you're relieved that they didn't damage your item. Um, this is really useful, as it turns out. We'll come back to this in part two. <laughs> foreshadowingly um, yes but for for part one most of this comes down to the parsing if you want to do that or the data entry if you do it that way mm -hmm. so i i like a challenge i did parsing um so if we scroll down to line 36 we can see i have a heavily commented section where i do all this parsing and so what I'm doing here is what I'm doing here is some funky stuff. Um, and so let's, let's quickly scroll up to the top of it, line 39, and we'll start there. Um, so for the starting items, I split it on the colon equals, and then I split it on comma and turn them into integers, and I just get a list. That's nice and easy. The hard one is for the operation. So I split it into A, op, B. Um, I don't use A, but I split it into that anyway to help me keep track of things. And then what I did was I made a, a bunch of lambda functions. Now, these lambda functions, are we've used them earlier on in our streams. If you missed that, then uh, I encourage you to swap back and have a look. But they are a way of defining a function sort of in an ad hoc nature. Um, so I don't, I don't have to know what the function is before the program runs. Um, in this case, what that means for us is we have, we check if the operation is plus or, mu or multiply, um, because that's going to change what our operation in our Lambda function is. And then if B is a number, then, for instance, here we say um, our lambda takes in X and returns X plus B. Ignore for a second this B equals int B. I'll come back to that in a bit. Um, but if B is not numeric, then we know that it's actually the word old. And so we do X equals X plus X. Um, I could have done X times two as well, but, you know, moot point. Um, and so th this gives us our lambda function, our operation function that each monkey has their own unique version of. And I'll still hold off on the b equals n times b. I'll do that after the next one, where we have this, uh, where we make our test function. Mm. Um, awesome. So just Should it would be helpful for me to go through mine because it is a bit less obfuscated than yours. Um. I think it probably would be, but also I feel like it would be more confusing to stop mine halfway through. Okie dokie. Um, so uh, then to find out the test function, um, again, I do a split, I get out the right chunk, and I uh, convert it to an integer, and then I make a new lambda function. And here we have m equals mod num. Now, I think this is a better spot to explain this, but this is exactly the same as what I'm doing up here with the b equals int b. And that is that, um, I'll keep it brief here, but lambdas don't have a scope. 
Now, what that means is that normally in programming, when you uh, call a function, that creates its own scope. It says, okay, if, if you've said, you know, um, you have a variable A, and then you've called a function, and inside that function, you create a new variable A, those are two separate A's. They're not related. Um, and so I can take this here, A here, and I can multiply it by 10, or I can divide it by two, or I can turn it into a letter, or it can be a totally different data type. It's unrelated to the other A outside our function. But the lambdas don't have that. And so what that meant is without this m equals mod num or b equals int b, whenever I called these lambda functions later and they used mod num or they used b, they were just using whatever mod num or b were on the global scope. Just, And in this case, it's whatever they were for the last monkey I parsed. So if the last monkey's b was 6, then every time any other monkey did an operation, it would be plus 6 or times by 6. Um, or it would be the x's. That was fine. Uh, similarly, for the mod nums, before I did m equals mod num, they would all test for whatever the last monkey tested for. And so in the, in the example code, in the example monkeys, that's 17. So all of them were just checking if the worry level was divisible by 17. And that doesn't work. Um, but what this does is this essentially, I would describe it as pegging the value. It, it says for, without going into the nuances of how it works, this says we care about B at this point. Uh, and so we're going to save it as this. And now we have a defined B that we can override at a later point if we wish, but I don't in this problem. Uh, but it's going to be the same even if we change this global B variable at a later time. It kind of it's reminds me of bind in JavaScript or just the general concept of currying where you do assign a value at the time of creation. And this is kind of like one you could override later, um, but yeah. not, you know, you don't in this case. Yes. Um, but it's definitely, that's definitely a weird part of this problem and a weird part of doing it my way. Uh, let's flop, uh, flip over to Renee's example, Renee's solution, yes. which does not have this problem in the slightest. Yes. <laughs> but when Jack explained it to me, I was like, what are you doing? I'm so confused. And then I now understand um, with the issue, the difference is really. Uh, so, yes, I've also created a class. Um, you had a class, right? We just did that. Yeah, I have a class. We, ha we just haven't got to it yet because we were discussing right. it. But, yeah, then, okay. I, then, then I take all of these values that I've parsed out and I make an instance of a class with it. Yeah, cool. So I've got my class and I did do what it was, you know, I thought was going to be the lazy way to copy all the things in. Um, so I've to create my monkeys, I've got my class and I've literally just copied it in, uh, which was both boring and arduous and then prone to error. Uh, so that's the downside of that. But I was like, yeah, this is fine. I can double check it. It'll be OK. And even on the triple check, I still found new issues. Uh, but it did really help me understand the problem as I was creating these things. Because like, as I said, on my first three read, read through of all the monkey instructions, I was like, oh, there's a lot here. There's a lot of different operations. But by the time I'd done like the third or the fourth one, I was like, oh, no, they're all the same. And I, I have regrets because not only have I only done three monkeys so far out of the eight, but I'm also going to want to do the example ones. And that's 12 monkeys to do all up. And that's a lot of monkeys. Uh, when you were trying to transcribe them across. Uh, so, but in creating them, I did, you know, fully understand what the problem was going to be. And I added all of my different bits and pieces. Basically, I've put in all of the information that is held in those monkey instructions. And while Jack has like computed some kind of on the way, which led to his issue where he needed to bind that value uh, to the Lambda, I've created the lambda for each of them and I've stored the lambda on the monkey function rather than passing it around later so that and I've also referred to each like referred to the monkey itself uh, when we execute those values so what I've done to create my monkeys I've said okay that's the monkey's name slash number it's got these values on it when it starts I've created a lambda function for that monkey and I'm, I'm storing that on the monkey and then I'm also creating a uh, Lambda function 
Yeah. Um, and yeah, so the thing is, I've, I've just put these numbers in here because I've just copied them across, but you could store this value or this operation on your monkey. Uh, so you just have it uh, available later, or you could just create this Lambda function for each thing. And rather than putting it in terms of variables, you could just create this Lambda function outright. Uh, so yeah, that therefore I didn't have the same issues with this number fluctuating. And yeah, you can do avoid that by actually creating it as a value of the monkey itself. Um, so when I do need to execute on these values, I can just say monkey, you know, whatever monkey I'm up to, monkey two dot, um, whatever I call this op or monkey two dot test. And that's going to use the values that are stored on there. Um, but yeah, you do have to get those values into the uh, function itself stored on your monkey. Otherwise you're going to have the same problem that Jack ended up with. So that's my tip there. And my tip is maybe do some of these, but then potentially you do want to actually uh, create these programmatically rather than copying them in because it is um, arduous and it's hard to debug if you don't get them all in there, which was a fun time. Uh, so yeah. And then, you know, I, it's very fast. Once you've got your monk is created just to loop through and then go through once we get to the second round, it's going to go from 20 to 10,000 cycles, but just to loop through all of those, popping a, an item off your monkey, um, the st start of the start of the list uh, that I've got of monkey items and going through for each monkey. And then, yeah, just counting up how many actions that monkey has taken and then moving those items around, etc. So here, yes, this part was originally divided by three. Um, which is that how you're going to decrease the worry between each monkey. I'll put this back because it will be relevant when we get to part two. Uh, but yeah, just executing each of those Lambda functions, which are stored on the monkey and ready to uh, work out if the monkey is true, where, we, where are we going to send that item? Um, it's going to go to you know the monkeys that have all stored all of these items here. Um, so I have access to all of my monkeys on the go. But that's kind of how the problem comes together once we've created some monkeys and worked out how to not have issues with Lambda functions or avoided them in some other way. That's kind of how the rest of the problem falls out. Yeah. So that's uh, that's part one. And as Renee said, iterating through doing, having the monkeys all do their operations, decreasing your worry, doing the test, passing to the next one, once per monkey in each round, 20 rounds. That's not too tricky. Part two is, I believe, the first big scaling problem of advent of code. So what this one says is your worry no longer decreases uh, by a factor of three each round. And you have to do 10,000 rounds now. And so what this rapidly creates, um, especially because one of your monkeys is I believe guaranteed to have um, a the worry squares as its operation is you rapidly get huge numbers that balloon out of control. You fill up all your RAM, um, or rather just hit the max integer value. Everything grinds to a screeching halt. And you can no longer output stuff, um, and your program doesn't work. So you need to find a way to decrease the worry without changing the maths. Now, we don't really have time to go into uh, modular arithmetic in a big way, but there are kind of two options you have. Um, you, you can, well, no, the, the things to think about for this are you need to find a way to decrease the value of the worry for each item without changing how that item affects the test conditions of any of the monkeys. So whatever value you had and whatever value you end up, the result of the modular uh, tests for all of the monkeys needs to stay the same. Um, that is, if you have one monkey that's doing modulo 5, one monkey that's doing modulo 10, 
if you're at 95 uh, for the worry value, then you need to, then to, to shrink that number down, you need to find a number that still gets you zero when you do modulo by five, because 95 mod five is zero, and still gets you five when you modulo 10, because 95 mod 10 gives you five. Um, now I picked handy numbers that a human could do. A good number to end up on there is five, because that is equivalent to that because five mod five is zero and five mod 10 is five. Now, how did we get to five though? Well, the, sol the solution, and this is a bit spoilery. Um, so you know, if, if you're, if you want to solve it for yourself with these hints, maybe, um, you just for about a minute, I'll try and keep it to a minute and keep it nice and quick. Um, but the solution there is to change your worry to the modulo of um, a value that you found. Now, that value, there's a couple of ways to calculate it, but the easiest way to find a valid value is to multiply all our modulo numbers together. So in this case, we have 5 and we have 10, so we get 50. Now, if we have our 95 worry value, and instead we change that to 95 mod 50, what that's going to give us is 45. And that holds true for our constraint of 45 mod 5 must equal 95 mod 5. It does. They're both zero. And 45 mod 10 must be equal to 95 mod 10. And it does. They're both five. Um, yeah, except you've written divide there. Uh, yeah, there's things, they just can't see them. <laughs> They're there. Yes, the modulos are there. Uh, but yes, we're getting 95 mod 5 and we're getting 95 mod 10. Um, get 5. Yeah. And yes, yep. we can do the same. I'll put the 95 mod 50. And we're going to note that this isn't necessarily the small, the best number to use, but it is a working number. That's kind of all yeah. that matters. So the the best number that you can use is what's known as the great, the, the lowest common product. Um, and that is the lowest number that you can get by, the, the lowest number that has both five and 10 as a product, as, as a factor. Um, and these are nice, easy, low numbers. And so we as a human know that that is 10 because 10 is divisible by 10, you get one. And 10 is divisible by five and you get two. Um, but once you've got like eight monkeys and they have numbers like 17 and 13 and three and five, you're like, well, oh, it could be anything and I can't work that out. And there's maths to do it. There's absolutely a formula to do this. And, um, you can look that up and learn that and implement it, but I did not want to. Uh, and just finding any product of all of the numbers still gets you the same result. And so... And it will keep your yeah. numbers sufficiently small that your computer doesn't want to melt down. Yes. Um, and so that's what you have to do. You now do 10,000 rounds, but instead of dividing by three, you set your worry value after you've done the operation to be the modulo of the product that you find of all of the, uh, let's call them worry conditions. Hmm. I think an interesting to note here about all of this is because we're taking the modulos and you're like, oh, okay, maybe we need to take modulos because that's what happens in each of the tests. Um, and so it's modulo 13, it's modulo 7 or whatever it is. So you're like, okay, I kind of understand how the modulos we can just take the modulos and we're just basically getting down to the smallest remainder that we can keep on hand. It's going to work for all of the different modulo conditions that we're using. But then you remember, oh, but we're still using the thing that comes out of that because that's the worry value in all of the other tests. So we're doing the addition tests and the multiplication tests, or not the tests, the um, worry incrementers essentially oh, um, that happen when we you know, you know, are checking it um, as we were in the question, the operation. 
Uh, but because it is you know, uh, multiplication and addition, we think about, okay, well, how does that relate to the questions like that we're answering here, basically the conditions and the changing that with a modulo? Does that still work with regard to multiplying it by itself and things like that? But when we think about that, we still get uh, the remainder is still going to be the same because we're still looping around, you know, to take the, you know, just get the remainder and maybe we're doing 45, but when we're adding something like plus three onto something like 45, and we're still, you know, we're not going to break the conditions that are set up because that still gets, you know, included in that modulo. And when you are looping around on something, an increment by three, it's still going to be respected by these conditions. Same with any multiplication. So that's how this all works out, if that makes sense to you. So you might have to you know, puzzle on it for a little while, but we promise that it does work out in the end uh, yeah. and it's all the, okay. The way that I would explain it is that um, addition doesn't, addition's the easy case because if you add two, that changes the result of the modulo by two especially if you consider it as mm -hmm. a circle, which That's is it. what a modulo is. When you multiply, however, the, the way, the handy thing here is, in this example with just two monkeys, where their conditions are five and 10, we have the product of 50. And that, at 50, the modulo of five and 10 is zero. And that's what this product is. That's why we've got this product. That's why, why we've selected this product to be our modulo here. So suppose then I come along and I multiply something by three is my operation that I'm going to do. Well, 50 multiplied by three is 150. And that actually still just gets us the modulo of zero for both five and 10. But what if I've got 51 and I multiply by three? Well, that gets me to 153. Now we have the modulo of three which uh, is, is correct, right? We had, we had one times three gives us a three on the whole thing. The way that's handy to think about this is that 51 multiplied by anything else is identical to 50 multiplied by something plus one multiplied by something um, for whatever one may be. 52 is the same, but two multiplied by something. And so... We know that that 50 multiplied by whatever chunk is always going to be divisible by 50. And because we know that 50 is always divisible by 5 and 10, we know that 50 multiplied by whatever is always going to be divisible by both 5 and 10. And so we can just forget that. We know that that chunk is irrelevant. It always passes our conditions. It doesn't matter. The only relevant bit is that 1. And that's what we're getting by doing this modulo 50. We're just chucking away the bit that we don't care about anymore. And we can find out how much of it we don't care about, how much we're allowed to not care about, or a reasonable amount to not care about is by taking the, you know, all those uh, chests that we're doing. So maybe it's, if we go back to the problem, um, let's go to, where is it? Yeah, when we go in here and we can see, yeah, all of these values that we don't have to care about. Um, back to the condition. Yeah, so we just take all of these, um, sorry, this one, 23, 19, 13, multiply them all together and then go, okay, that's how much we're not we're allowed to not care about because it's going to just loop around. It's just extra cycles essentially on our modulo, but they're all irrelevant. All we actually care about is the last, you know, one or the last five or whatever as long as you know and that's with respect to each one of those so we'll find out where all those cycles intersect essentially by multiplying all of these together um to get something yeah yeah cool um so that's that's tricky that one required a lot of maths and a lot of thinking but we got there yes um, um so yeah for this what you do just end up with looking at jack's code so we've changed this to be 10,000. I see that Jack, you've had your original 20 and then you have another 20. Yeah, that doesn't actually work because uh, for the first 20, the I have that divide by three and oh, for the yes. second, <laughs> but forget about that. I just had to tweak the whole thing. Um, yeah, cool. Yes. <laughs> so it doesn't really matter. Yeah. 
But yes, but you can yes, see I do here 10, the lowest common multiple LCM. Yeah, lowest common multiple. Uh, I didn't end up doing that, but I didn't rename okay. the variable because I'm bad at my job. I come back here. Uh, your job to do this. But yeah, so I'll come into mine where I've just done for i in range yeah, 10,000. We've done 10,000 loops. Before here, I had a integer division of three, uh, but you can just replace that and make it the modular of all the what I've called prod, which is the product of, where did I make prod? Here it is, which is just all of those things that have taken out of here. Um, and then, yeah, I could, probably could have gathered them off the monkeys rather than having to write them out again myself. But anyway, um, we've taken that. And yeah, then we can just do that. And it's really a simple code change. And then you run that and it should work, you know, in not too long, uh, which is good. Yeah. And then you just okay. sort it and get the top ones and you're good to go. Yeah. Cool. Now, we're at time. So shall we really quickly skim through 12 and 13? Yeah, dudes, we'll just take the toppest, tippest without actually going through the code, I think. Um, yeah. So, so we'll go to the first one, which I believe is a one about finding. finding a path. Yeah. Here's our so, example. In almost every advent of code, uh, there's, there's one or two pathfinding problems. Um, and then they, they always have a set of constraints and they're almost always on a uh, direct grid rather than arbitrary points or different travel distances or travel costs or whatever. But uh, there's a pathfinding problem. My recommendation, my top big tip is read about Dijkstra's and A-star preferably Dijkstra's. Um, if you do that, that will give you the, the pathfinding algorithms that will work for basically every advent of code pathfinding problem. You might need to tweak them occasionally. You might need to add another constraint or whatever. Um, but yeah, that's right, Dijkstra. Uh, how about Dijkstra's? I just, how about you, can, you, can you put it in the chat? Or, uh, yeah, if I can spell it, that's going to be the first part uh you're you're correct there d j i k s t r a okay can i give a little quick explanation of what dijkstra's is um yes. just so you know you've ended up in the right place uh give me a pen and that's good okay and yeah so dijkstra's is basically a, gra a graph theory um you know, algorithm. So let's say we have a giraffe and we have a bunch of different places and you can get to them from multiple locations, etc. You need to get from some start to some end position. So this is a small graph, but you know, that could be good. And they all have some sort of weight or length that it has. So maybe it's seven and two whoop, and four and one and two again. And Let's, yeah, let's say four here, et cetera, and one, whatnot. So we could go, basically Dijkstra's is a way of going through this and finding the new lowest number of, you know, shortest distance to get every spot. So we start at the start, we want to get to the end, and then we want to uh, go through and we'll start at the start and be like, okay, well, we can see these two places. Let's start with the one that's the shortest distance. So let's go to two. Um, and we're going to go here first, and then we're going to find out it takes two to get to here, and then we'll continue on through the graph. Um, okay, well, where can we go next? And so we can go here with two. This maybe isn't a great example because it's going to take us straight to the end. Um, I'm going to change this to be <laughs> nine. <laughs> um, and then we can get to here with four, and we go four. Okay, well, what else can we see from here? Well, we could go there with nine. That's going to be a lot, so that would take us a long time. We could go here with another four, so that would get us up to six. So let's go here, and then we can keep going through. So we're now, okay, where's the new closest, closest thing? So that's got us up to here with six, and we go, okay, we'll go to the end from here, etc. cetera. Um, but we can look through basically the whole graph to find out if there is a faster way to get to anywhere, yep. um, and this is so, what this is about. So the two big... Uh, tips for using Dijkstra's with Advent are that most of the time, um, all of those um, 
all of those edges are of length one. Um, essentially, we're having a grid where it takes one step to step from any cell to any adjacent cell. Um, so all of these will be length one. Um, that means that uh, rather than checking like, oh, well, is six lower than four or whatever, um, it, it's actually just the, effectively, it's how many steps have we taken will be the total cost. The other uh, thing, the other great thing about Dijkstra's is that it is what is called a breadth first search, asterisk. It, it, it behaves like a breadth first search in important, in some important ways for this kind of pathfinding problem. Um, and what I mean by that is that rather than picking any path and going straight for the target and then finding other ones, it's always going to check like what, what has been the quickest to get to, what's been the shortest path so far, I'm going to extend that one out. Um, and a benefit of that is that a benefit of that, when your steps are all equal length, like in Advent of Code, is that as soon as you find where you're trying to get, you know that that is the shortest path or equal to the shortest path. Because essentially, you've got a grid, it's always one step, one cost to move to a different node, and you're always expanding out from whichever node has had the fewest steps to get to it. So essentially, you are just radiating out from your starting point, um, constrained by whatever other parameters there might be. In this problem, there are essentially cliffs. You cannot go up. Um, and so two nodes might be side by side by their grid coordinate, but you cannot move between them. Essentially, there is no link there. Mm. So it radiates out, and then it will go around all those bends and everything. And as soon as it finds the node you're trying to get to, that is the shortest distance to that node. Um, yeah, so I think the hot tip for this one is turn this into a graph um, because we can go, we start out at a height A, we can go to A, and from there we can go to B, but B and Q are not next to each other in the alphabet, so those are too far a height distance. So we need to create a graph just like the one I've just drawn, um, but not everything is connected to its neighbour in here, so we would connect a to A and A to B, but not B to Q, but we would connect B to C, um, et cetera. So things like that. So yeah, S not to Z. So we have to parse this into the form of a graph, really. Yeah, I think yeah. That's, that's how to do this one, really, um, is to implement Dijkstra's algorithm by turning this into a graph. Yep. Shall um, we pop on to 13? Yeah. So real quickly on 13. 13 is a parsing problem. But you can cheat. I love to cheat. Um, it's not cheating. It's just using useful tools. So here we have a bunch of lists. And these lists might contain sublists. And for this problem, we've got to compare numbers within them. Um, there's a bunch of rules and so on. And you'll have to compare, like, you know. Uh, and then in part two, you've essentially got to sort all of these lists rather than doing it pairwise. But here's my big hot number one tip for this problem in python you can type at the start of your program and if we flip over to the code you can see it's line two on the code that i pasted in uh, of day 13. day 13 yes um i'm in the wrong one you're That's in the wrong one yeah yeah there, there we go. go day 13. from json import mm -hmm. loads not uh, or load S rather. This is my big hot tip because rather than me having to work out which brackets are inside which other brackets and where do they, they end and what's in equivalent positions and so on, I let whoever develops the JSON library, which is probably the Python foundation, um, I let them do that. I just said loads. And so I take in the line and I... Uh, loads it, which turns it into an array in Python or a list in Python. And then I made this compare function that takes two lists and does the comparisons that the program describes. But it just meant that I could just iterate through the two lists. I didn't have to then 
go and write my own parser for these two lists. I didn't have to do all sorts of weird, complicated, mm. messy stuff. All I had to do, like all the parsing is just handled by loads. That's, you know, yeah, I, that's I, definitely I, a hot tip there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I expect that this problem would have taken me like five times as long, like five times the time and probably like four times the code. Absolutely. Uh, I, that's if a I had not done that. So top tip straight up there in the first part. That's it. <laughs> and then yep. you just do what the question says without being like, oh, goodness, how are we going to get that stuff into a bunch of lists and make sure I don't miss any things? And you've got, I'm testing for angle for the square brackets and I'm splitting yep. up on the list. I'm just like, no, this is actually just JSON code as it is, yeah, JSON format. So we can yep. just have that because thank you, Python and the world. So, yeah, that's Yay. good. I like that. Uh, one. Yeah, so that's my, that's my number one tip. That makes it so much easier. Amazing. Cool. Well, let's go to our final slide. No, I'm going the wrong way. Oh, yes. Cool. Well, I never talked about our leaderboard. If you do want to join our leaderboard, it's still up there and active. I'm going to put it into the chat for you all to come on board with us. Um, yeah, and we hope to see you on the leaderboard. Got a couple of keen beans on there. Um, yeah, so that's mostly what we've got for today's episode. If you have if you still want to learn more Python, uh, you can get on board with our Crowd Skills Challenge, which Sarah has put in the uh, links already above. We'd love to see you on there as well. And yeah, you can check out all of this code in the Advent of Code repo, which Sarah has also posted for us as ready. Um, so yeah, let me just double check because I can't copy out of my slide. It's not quite right. Okay, we've got our leaderboard link coming through as well. And then, yeah, we'll see you on the leaderboard. Hopefully see you on the Cloud Skills Challenge as well or in the repo. Feel free to leave us a comment or a review. Uh, yeah, what am I trying, trying to say? A, an issue. That's how you can talk to us <laughs> on the repo if you want to. Um, yeah. So, yeah, cool. Yeah. Well, Sarah had a question for us. If I'm, I'm using Swift, which is strongly typed, the JSON trick doesn't work because I can't tell what it gives. May, might have to use a different language for this one. Oh, good I, you know, thoughts there, Sarah. Not everything has all the same tricks in the different programming languages, so that is a good one to note there if you're not using Python. But hopefully a lot of other libraries will support Swift potentially. So, yeah, or not Swift, support JSON. That's what I'm hoping. Um, but, yeah, let us know what you find out. Yeah. Mm, right. You have to give it an either an int or an array, says Sarah. Um, yeah. yeah. As what it's going to return as a result. So yeah, Python is very untyped. Uh, so that'll help you here. Yeah. Okay. The, um, I I I still think maybe Swift will work because the root element will always be an array. But I'm not a Swift programmer. I'm not very familiar with it. Um, I I might do some digging and see what I can find, but. Yeah, but that's all we have time for today and for this year on In the Code Garden. So we hope to see you back in, next year in 2023 for some more code gardening fun with me and all my fun guests that will come on. Thank you so much for to Jack for being here today and for this whole series to tell us about his thoughts on Advent of Code and to percolate ideas with me. Uh, it's been Yay. lots of fun. Yeah, I've had a great time. It's it's been an absolute blast. And uh, look, I I didn't need an excuse to do Advent of Code, but it's nice to have one. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's it. I've promised to do Advent of Code for somebody else, so I'll just have to do it. Uh, so yeah, that's it. Thank you all so much. Hope you all have a lovely holiday season if you are celebrating anything at this time of year. And we will see you again in the new year. Thanks, everyone. And yeah, goodbye. <laughs>